Welcome back to EGM 702, Photogrammetry and Advanced Image Analysis. This is week one, part two, scale and parallax. So in part one, we introduced photogrammetry. We talked a little bit about um, what it is, how we can do photogrammetry, who does photogrammetry, why we do photogrammetry. Uh, and in this, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the fundamental principles behind photogrammetry starting with scale and parallax. So to begin with, let's talk a little bit about how a camera works. So this is a helpful diagram uh, provided by Luc Giraud from the University of Oslo. And you can see we have an object, we have a lens, we have a diaphragm, a shutter, we have the body of the camera, and then we have a sensor or film here where we're recording the image of the real world. So to start with, we have electromagnetic radiation and that leaves an object. So it's either reflecting off of the object or it's being emitted by the object or it's being transmitted by the object. It doesn't really matter. It leaves the object, it enters the lens of the camera. Once it enters the lens of the camera, the lens captures it and focuses it so it directs it all in the same direction towards the sensor of the camera. When the shutter opens for a very brief moment, most of the time, we record the image on the sensor or the film, depending on what kind of camera we're using. And we say the image of the object, because you'll notice that the image is actually flipped upside down in this case. And in fact, it's actually reversed uh, in film cameras. It's reversed both in direction and tone. Um, so bright areas appear darker, dark areas appear brighter. Um, I have a link at the end of the presentation uh, that goes a little bit more into why that is so if you're interested. Okay, so once we have that, uh, if we have a film camera, so when we're in the before times, we have to actually go out and develop the film uh, with a modern digital camera. We usually don't have to do that. Uh, we just use the images more or less as is. Okay, so we have our image geometry here. Um, we have the negative, which again is the reversal of the geometry and possibly the tone. Uh, we have our camera lens, which is also sometimes referred to as an exposure station. And then we have the real world that we are taking a picture of. And sometimes you might also see diagrams that include the positive print, um, so the, the scaled image, but in the correct geometry here. Okay, so again, the image that's recorded is scaled down. It is it is a scaled version of reality, and we'll talk about what exactly that means in a minute. So now, historically, the image coordinates, so when we're talking about the, the location in the image recorded by the camera, uh, we historically define those starting from the center of the image, which is also called the principal point, or sometimes the, um, the optical center of the image, um, and this is basically the, the center of the geometry. Modern software doesn't always use this definition. Uh, the example that we'll use in the practical doesn't, doesn't really use this, but um, it's sort of the traditional way of thinking about, um, about the camera geometry. So cameras introduce distortion. You've probably heard some part of this. This shouldn't be a complete surprise to you. So if we look at this picture of a building here, we can see the roof line, and we also see that the roof line is curved. If I draw a straight line on it, you'll see that it bows out a little bit from the straight line. We can calculate and correct this distortion, and in fact, this is a big part of what we're going to be doing with our photogrammetric workflows. Um, and you can see what the result looks like here. So we've basically stretched the image out a little bit. Um, and you see that once we've corrected for the distortion of the lens, we have 
uh, a roof line that more or less matches up with our straight line. Okay, so normally we look at the distortion. Uh, so if we start with our checkerboard pattern here, um, we see two main types of distortion caused by the camera lens. Uh, the first is what is known as barrel distortion or positive distortion. And this is where the where straight lines are bent outward from the center of the image. So it looks a little bit like we've wrapped this around a barrel. The other one is what is sometimes known as pincushion distortion or uh, also negative distortion. And this is where the straight lines are bent out away from the center of the image. And as you can see from these two different examples, the amount of distortion generally increases the farther from the center of the image or the principal point that we go. And this is why it is also known as radial distortion. So it is increasing with radial distance from the center of the image. So if we have a calibration target like this, we can take pictures of that with our camera and we can actually calculate the distortion directly. If we don't have access to the camera, for example, if we're using historical images, uh, we might be able to find a calibration report that tells us about the, uh, the estimated distortion in the camera, uh, but we can also take multiple images of the same object and use that to actually calibrate the distortion, and we'll do more of that in the practical this week. Okay, so moving now to scale, what you see here is an example of an air photo, and you can see that it represents some real-world objects, and we also have some measured distances on the photograph itself and their corresponding uh, distances in the real world. So again, the image is a smaller version of reality. It's scaled down. The scale is the relationship between the distance in the photograph and the real world. You've seen this with maps before. You've probably also talked about this with uh, satellite images or uh, even with photographs as well. So that relationship, the ratio of the uh, photograph distance to the real world distance is how we define the scale. So one way that we can measure scale is by comparing known ground distances to the size in the photograph and that should give us the scale of the image. So for this example here we have the scale S is the distance in the image, which is 0.119 inches, divided by the distance in the real world, 59.1 feet. And if we do that math, what we end up with is a scale of one over about 5,960, uh, which means that for every inch in our photograph, that represents 5,960 inches in the real world. Often we lack this knowledge we don't have the ability to go out and measure distances on the ground in all of our images. Fortunately, we have geometry, which will come to our rescue. So if we have a distance, lower or large D, uppercase D on the ground here, corresponding to a distance in an image, lowercase D, if we know the distance between the camera and the ground, which is usually denoted by H, flying height, and we know the focal length, so the distance between the camera lens and the, um, and the sensor or the film, which is usually denoted as F. We know that the ratio of the, we know that the ratio of the distance in the image to the distance on the ground is, the, is exactly the same as the ratio of the focal length to the flying height. So that's great news. So what happens when the flying height is not constant? So what happens if we have uh, either a change in flying height because the airplane is going up or down? Or what happens when we have uh, a, dis a difference in that height because we have a difference in elevation on the ground? So 
outside of Ohio, it turns out that the ground isn't always flat, and we might have hills or mountains or other interesting topographic features. When we have these interesting topographic features, the fact that they are a different distance than the object at the bottom of it, um, that, that difference in elevation causes these objects to lean away from the principal point. So they appear displaced, which is why this is often called relief displacement, or it might also be called foreshortening, depending on which source you're looking at. So we see that buildings, for example, look like they're leaning out away from the center of the image. And in fact, we can probably guess that the center of the, uh, of the camera or the, the, uh, the satellite sensor that was used to acquire this image is somewhere off in this direction. Um, so the amount of displacement that we see depends on the height, but it also depends on the distance from the principal point. So the further away from the center of the image that we go, the more displacement that we see, the more foreshortening that we see. Um, and we can see why this is with a simple diagram. So we have our building on the ground here. The top of the building is point B. The bottom of the building is point A. And if we look at where these points are projected in the image, they are not the same. B is actually a bit further away from the center of the image, the perspective center or the principal point, then A is, even though on the ground they have the same location. And this is something that we're going to have to deal with uh, when we talk, with, that we'll talk a bit more about with air photos, but this is a really useful thing. This actually means that we can, with more than one image, we can actually figure out what the distance a to B is, we can figure out what the height of the building is. So now we're going to do a short exercise. So what I want you to do is to hold your thumb at arm's length from your body and hold it still. I want you to close your left eye and now I want you to close your right eye while opening your left eye. And what you should notice is that your thumb appears to move back and forth and you can close your left eye and open your right eye and go back and forth like that and you can see that your thumb appears to be moving. So this apparent displacement of your thumb is what is known as parallax. So this is caused because we have a change in the viewing location of an object while the object is not necessarily moving. Try the same thing but this time, move your thumb closer to your face. So instead of holding your thumb at arm's length, maybe hold it at half of your arm's length and do the same thing over again. Does your thumb move more or does it move less? So go ahead and try that. Maybe hit pause and move on to the next slide. So it turns out that the amount of parallax, the amount of displacement that we see depends on the distance between the observation point, in this case your eye, and the object that is being observed, in this case your thumb. So if we look at the diagram here, we see that the star is at a certain distance, there's a certain amount of parallax as we move from one viewing station to another. If we move our star a little bit closer, we see that there is actually significantly more distance, even though, the, um, even though our two viewing stations are in the same place. And again, the reason for this is, is pretty easy to see if we look at the diagram. If we look at the sight rays from one viewing station to the object and where that lines up on our background. So this is something that we can use to measure the distances to objects. This is, for example, how we measure height from multiple air photos. Uh, this is also something that is used quite a bit for astronomy because this, before we had uh, some of the more advanced instrumentation and, and understanding that we have in modern astronomy, um, we understood the concept of parallax. We were able to use this, for example, uh, to measure the distance from the Earth to the Sun by watching, by observing Venus moving across the face of the Sun from two different points on the Earth's surface. 
and that gave us, gave us the distance from Earth to Venus, and because we knew the relative distances from Venus to the Sun and Earth to the Sun, we were able to work out what the distance to the Sun is. So, to sum all of this up, we can use geometry to relate the objects that we see in an image to the real world, either because we can directly measure those objects in the real world, or because we know uh, the different parameters of the camera and how far the camera was from the ground, if we're thinking about an air photo. This isn't always easy. Um, if we have uneven terrain, that can cause shifts in position um, that can become problematic, but we can also use those shifts in position to calculate the distance and eventually the three-dimensional coordinates or topography of the objects that we see in the image. Uh, I've got a number of different resources here for you. Uh, the first is, uh, again, the chapter three in Lilis M. Kiefer and Chipman. Uh, it talks a bit more about some of these concepts, especially scale. Um, I've got a link to the lecture from EGM 310. Uh, that talks about digital images, which talks a little bit more also about how cameras work. Uh, so you can go and look at that if you want to learn a little bit more about that. Um, and then some videos from the Las Cumbres Observatory, uh, as well as some more information about the transit of Venus, um, and some more, uh, another lesson about uh, how we use parallax to observe stars. So that's all for now. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any questions, please post them in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Thanks. Bye.